So I already touched on this. In April, we did uh, Passover. That's the resurrection. June, we did Pentecost. That's equivalent with the Holy Spirit in the second chapter of Acts. Now we're coming up on Tabernacles, which I'm going to say is our season of ruling as a kingly priesthood. Okay? They didn't know how to do that. They got lands that they weren't expecting, that they didn't build. They knew it was going to be a promised land, but they didn't have to build those houses. They didn't have to plant those crops. And if you didn't have to work for it, you don't know what to do with it. You don't know the price it took to get there. And it was still a blessing, but God had to teach them about stewardship and responsibility. And isn't it interesting? I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but he said, I'm not going to give you all the land at once. I'm going to give it to you a piece at a time so you can grow into your gifting. So you don't have to despise the process that you're in. You got a prophetic word, but you're not seeing it come to pass yet. That's because you're in process. You don't get a lot of amen, so thank you, whoever said that. I put the amplifier on that. Amen. The process isn't fun, but you grow. You grow through it. And I had another friend who played for the Seattle Mariners in, the, in Major League Baseball these many years ago, and he was uh, not only in uh, Major Leagues for a little while, but he was in camp with Alex Rodriguez, who's a Hall of, Flame, Hall of Fame player. We should have the Hall of Flame. That would be good. But Alex Rodriguez was a Hall of Famer. And uh, he said that nobody could beat that guy and get to the field earlier than Alex Rodriguez. And nobody stayed longer than Alex Rodriguez. That's setting by example, don't you think? I mean, I may not win, but it's not going to be because I wasn't prepared. I, I may lose the game, but it won't be because I was too tired to finish. I was in shape. I did the part I could handle. Now, that could sound like a lot of works mentality. The point is, most times if people are successful, it's not because they got lucky. Right? We don't even believe in that. There's effort that has to go into it. And, and I'm just going to show you a clip from uh, Dutch in a minute, but I just want to talk about this month because it ties in with what we're saying. It's the month of Tamu Tamuz, is how I heard somebody else pronounce it. And it's the fourth month. So remember, we started in April. And what was the holiday in April? First one is Passover. And then we came forward 50 days later. That's about two months later. So April, May, June. In June, we celebrated what? Pentecost. And now we're in the fourth month, right? So this is the April that we're in. This is that season of summer where they have to work the fields. But they're used to being a wandering people in the desert. They don't know about working the fields. Anybody been a farmer before? Man, it's hard work. Got one over here. Not too many, but man, it's hard work, isn't it? Every day, the animals want to be fed. They don't care what day it is. You've got to get up and feed them and, and the crops and any, all the work that goes into it. So Israel had to relearn. Now, the benefit of having land that you can harvest is you stop wandering, but you have to steward that gift that God gave you, and you have to make tough decisions along the way. That's the kingly part, all right? I don't want to beat that point to death. But this is what our newsletter said this month about this month. It's a month of covenant rights which are linked with power and strength. This is the month where Israel sinned. What, how did she sin? By what? Choosing. Can you read it? By choosing to create and worship a golden calf rather than the creator. I just wanted to focus on choosing because remember that fork in the road comes. That moment of truth comes. And when Israel was waiting for Moses to come back, they took the wrong fork in the road, didn't they? They said, you know what? He's not coming back, Aaron. We need you to make us a God that we can worship because Moses just isn't coming back. Boy, that happens a lot, doesn't it? Where we just pull the trigger too fast. If, if I'm a priestly king and I'm hearing from the Lord, he'll help me rule my spirit and not get hijacked by fear. But if I get in my Saulish realm, Saul was a king, but he was, a, he was driven by his manly flesh, his soulishness. He wasn't committed to God, and he did a very similar thing. He offered up the sacrifice. When Samuel told him to wait, he rushed it. And the people pressured Aaron, and he ended up making that golden calf. But they chose that. See, this is the month, that fourth month. You come out of Passover and Pentecost. Now you're entering into this third dimension. See what I mean by that? It's not training camp. It's not maneuvers. It's war. Now you have to say, the buck stops here. I'm the king, and I'm also going to be the priest. hope it's making sense to you. 
What would a golden calf look like in your life? Leah asked when she wrote the newsletter this month. <laughs> because that's what we have to be aware of. They're always there, aren't they? But the more on fire you keep yourself for the Lord, the more you burn for him, the less likely you're going to create a golden calf. And God hates golden calves. He said, tear down idols. Don't have any other idols before me. This is a regular daily thing you should do, right? Start your day with communion in the morning. Dedicate your day to the Lord. Say, I want to detox today. I want a fresh start. I don't want any golden calves. And then similarly, it's also the month that the spies came back. And what did Israel do? They chose to come into agreement with the negative report. Same thing, right? Fork in the road. We got two spies saying we can take the land. They chose to listen to the ten spies. And that's not being a king, is it? Kings rule. They don't take the easy way out. They make the tough decisions. All right, so I'm going to do this Dutch sheets. Got to be careful how you say his name. So I'm going to just list. I'm going to categorize these. Wish I had the PowerPoint, but next time. Seven different categories. Of what it looks like and what we've been doing as an oikos, house of God. And when he adds ecclesia, what it looks like. And since I don't have a PowerPoint, I have some little aids here. <laughs> so when I say this side, you're going to see family. And all the pastoral, loving, kind people are going to stand up and probably shout me down. But when I hold this up, what is that? That's ecclesia. So I'm going to go through some of this so quickly. All I want to do is say oikos, ecclesia, and describe what that looks like. Are you with me so far? Can you follow me on this? So, yeah. so you don't need to write. You need to look up here or the screens. Okay. So oikos, crossing over into also the understanding of ecclesia. The first of the seven categories is simply the overall concept, which I've already basically described, so I'll just review it. We are a family. We are a body. We are the bride. We are his flock of sheep. This is the relational aspect of the kingdom of God. Are we going to abandon it? No, we are not. This is the governmental, legislative, congressional side. Ambassadors, warriors, soldiers, the governmental and military side. We've been struggling to enter into this. We haven't done it real well. And in fact, those of us that are trying to do it, you just need to know right now we're a remnant. In fact, we're a remnant of the remnant. There's going to be a tremendous tension between the two. Uh, people telling me all the time, you need to quit talking about the warfare stuff. You need to quit talking about the governmental stuff. You just need to love each other. And all the pastoral people are saying, if you just love each other, everything would be okay. And we loved each other through the charismatic movement. We lost America. Because we didn't understand that we're an ecclesia called to disciple a nation. So while we were getting people saved, the world around us was discipling America. I said, while we were getting them saved, the world around us was discipling America. And they took over government. And they took over education. And they took over media and arts and entertainment. And we're going to take it back. Stand up for a second if you agreed and you clapped on that one. Come on. Lift up your hand. Lord, help me. Help me know what my role is in that part of taking back the culture. We got the priestly side down real good. The family part's great. I want to know what ecclesia means in my life. I want to translate this into how I act today when I leave here differently. I don't want it to be a theory. I want to put it into practice. I want to put it into practice how to be a king in this culture how to be Eleazar when everybody else is retreating. I'm going to take my stand, and I'm going to defeat that enemy in Jesus' name. So, Lord, I speak over every one of your people. They've got their hands up now because they're volunteering for this army. Like he said, we're a remnant of the remnant. It's much easier to bask in the family side and never deal with the contending side. But nothing comes into existence without resistance. 
There will always be contending. When there's anything valuable on the line, the enemy is going to fight you for it. He doesn't counterfeit pennies. He counterfeits 20s and 100s because they're worth something. But we are an, an untapped power source for the Lord. That if we will step into the kingly role that we've been given, we're a kingly priesthood. Lord, I just speak it over everyone here that you will translate this theory into practice in their lives and you will show them what to do and they will not be satisfied until they find that calling in Jesus' name. Amen. There you go.